Baptist Church, let's stand together. Turn in the hymnals to page number 43. Page 43, nothing but the blood. Page number 43. Page 43, Regina. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Let's bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for that, the blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, that, that cleanses us, Lord, that enables us to have a relationship with you. Father, I just thank you for our pastor that he's back. And Lord, I just ask that, oh Lord, we would uh, get something from the word of God tonight. Lord, I'm, I'm excited to be in church. And, and uh, Lord, thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's turn on to page number 55. Page 55, At the Cross. Page number 55. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Was it for crimes that I have done, he groaned upon the tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. On the last. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, 
And the burden of my heart rolled away It was there by faith I received my sight And now I am happy all the day Grace, sing, you may be seated. Well, praise the Lord. Good to see you here this evening. It is good to be back home in our home church. Um, me and my wife, we went to Vermont this weekend. I was asked to preach at a, um, at a revival service they were having out there. And um, they were doing kind of a two thing. They were having revival services, but it was um, for Pastor Appreciation Month. And I said, what is that? I've never heard of that. You know, I, I, nobody's ever said anything at my house. They have a pastor, no, just kidding. <laughs> but they had a pastor appreciation month and it was his 44 years in the ministry. And so um, they were doing a big special thing for him and everything. So I was able to preach there twice on um, Saturday and Friday night. They had um, brother Mark Rogers. Some of you might know some of his music they've had around him and his family were there. So um, that was a blessing. <clears throat> and they're not on the list for quarantining and all that stuff. So that worked out real good. Um, but we um, got a good time. My wife got a little mad at me because while I was there, the pastor asked me, since I know construction, asked me to help him fix his, his shed roof. And so I had to build a shed roof and everything for him while I was there, which definitely didn't help my torn um, hamstring. <laughs> so, so that didn't help at all. So that gave me, set me back some. But yeah, hopefully that was a blessing to them while we were out there. And it seemed like it was really good. So praise God. And it is good to be back home. Amen. There is nothing like home. That, that truly is. I don't know. It must be. When I was younger, I loved going out and doing things. Now as I'm getting older, I'm like, I like being home. And I just like being home in my, my life. Amen. All right. Now, besides that, we do have um, both units, the air cleaner units activated and working in our auditorium. So they're on both sides um, and working very well. So praise the Lord for that. So nobody, if you get sick, it's not from here. Amen. We got the highest, best filtration thing we got, plus now the air purifier and everything. And we got God, the Holy Spirit, in our service. So it ain't happening from here. Amen. So uh, let's see. What else do we have? Uh, let's see. The um, revival service that we we're supposed to have in a couple weeks here, um, we have canceled that. Um, for several different reasons, of course, you know, because of COVID and everything, and California is going off and on on their list of New York, so they'd have to quarantine when they're here kind of thing, but right now they're off um, at the same time, but we don't have all of our people back and everything, so we decided to um, just forego that um, for this year. So we're going to just kind of limit everything for the remainder of the year as far as any extra services and things that we do have. Um, so, but with that, he is going to be going to um, North Tonawanda with Ca Pastor Constantino. He's going up there for a couple nights. Um, since he's not coming here, he'll be going up there. So if anybody wanted to travel up there and hear him, that would be a blessing. Amen? Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, as far as the roof goes, um, I know people are given, please do. I don't believe we're going to get the, um, the loan from the bank for our roof this year. They are being super restrictive because of COVID and churches not being at full capacity, not fully um, doing all the stuff that is, that is expected. So they're being super strict on everything. They gave us like a 12 page fill out they want us to do and they're asking too many intimate questions like the people in the church, how many, what's the income levels of people. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. So um, they, sounds like it's really crazy restrictive right now. So we're not going to be able to do that through the bank. So that just means you have to get into your pocket a little deeper. Amen. <laughs> so get a little bit more. Um, so we'll see. The Lord knows. So we'll see what goes on. I'm not going to give a whole bunch of information that they don't need. So um, we'll just see what the, what the Lord does. Amen. Uh, let's see. What else do we have? Um, <clears throat> Operation Christmas Child. Um, this month we are um, taking up finances for that. Um, we want to send out 75 boxes this year. Last year we sent out 50. This year we wanted to do 75 and it's $9 per box. So if you can give what you, what you can, give whatever you can. So as many boxes that we get together financially we'll be able to send out and um, be a blessing to those children. Amen. So just when you do that, if you put it in an envelope, mark it on there for Operation Christmas Child so we know where that money, um, so it definitely goes to that cause. All right. Also, please pray. Um, I know this is a crazy year politically and stuff, and I don't get into the midst of all that stuff, but I tell you, this um, Supreme Court um, nominee and stuff, 
that is huge for us as Christians. It sounds like this nominee, Amy Comey Bear, is a conservative judge at least. You never know what they're going to vote for when they're in there. But as Christians, this is something we really should be praying for. Amen? Because the more conservative judges we get in there, the better it is for laws and everything else for the most part. Of course, I don't always vote according to, you know, what we would think. But um, there is a decent track record in that area. So we really need to pray. Amen. Pray as Christians that God will allow that to happen if it's his will. All right. Other than that, um, I need you praying for the Hood family right now. Um, Brother Steve's father passed away um, just the other day. And um, so we really need to pray for them at this time. I mean, he had some health issues, as you know, we've been praying for him, but um, it was kind of unexpected at this point. Um, so if you would pray for him, the funeral is going to be on Saturday. It's um, invitation only because of everything. So um, just pray for the family um, during this and pray that if you would pray that the gospel will get very clearly given. Amen. It's the funeral is going to be at a Lutheran church because that's where the, his parents go to. Um, and I'm going to be able to speak for a short time. They're not giving me much, but I'm going to do what I can to try and give that out. But just pray that we can get out the gospel during that time. Amen. All right. Let's see. Other than that, um, the last thing is um, pray for revival. That's this month is our theme for the month of October, praying for revival. It's kind of ironic that we had to cancel our revival services. <laughs> I, thought that was, I, was like, I was thinking that would be like on a bulletin joke thing, you know, <laughs> pray for revival. We're canceling the revival services for the month. <laughs> yeah, but revival is not just services as revival begins in the heart. Amen. So let's pray for all of us. We all need true revival. Amen. All right. I think that's all I have at this point. All right, let's stand again for our last song this evening, page 59. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, page 59. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Cast your care on Jesus today. very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Troubled soul, the Savior can see. sing. You may be seated. Let's pray for the offering. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for um, the opportunity to give. Lord, um, we, we have so much to be thankful for, and Lord, we have a, a great church, a great pastor. Lord, it's asked to help us to be faithful in the area of giving, and uh, Lord, we know you'll take care of us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, Brother Marvin. What a blessing. Amen. All right. Um, as you turn to Mark 11, Mark 11, I'll give you a couple facts about God's creations that he has created. Butterflies taste with their feet. Isn't that kind of strange? They taste with their feet. That'd be a disgusting meal. Amen. They said, Gen 2 penguins use a pebble to propose to their girlfriends. I knew that one because I watched the movie, Happy Feet. Amen. And then, uh, let's see, cows have very complex friendships. When they are isolated from their companions, they actually experience separation anxiety. That's kind of weird. I never heard of that. Amen. And they don't like country music. So we got those two things with cows that we've learned about. Amen. Let's see. And once a giant clam picks a spot on the, uh, to live on a reef, it doesn't move for the rest of its life. That's pretty neat. Amen. I wish I was kind of like that. Just have one home. That's it. There, there for the rest of your life. Amen. All right. Mark 11. Praise the Lord for being back here. And, you know, I'm sure you guys were well taken care of while I was gone. I tried catching up on the messages, but they weren't on um, YouTube this last week, but they were working that out. Um, they'll get that straightened out. Um, but those are at home, if you're listening today and you're at home from our church, um, just let everybody know we have not had any outbreaks or anything here at the church. Nobody's gotten the virus and stuff from anything from the church. Praise the Lord for that. Pray that that continues. But we also have done everything possible that we can possibly do, I believe, as a church to keep us um, definitely, what's the words, up to way above what CDC asked for with all the ventilation, the heating, the air purifying, and all that stuff, and cleaning. We've done everything we could, so um, I believe it's starting to get to the point where you can start feeling pretty safe um, in churches. But of course, that's up to you guys. Amen. And just pray for those that, because there's a, a number of people that still haven't been able to come back, haven't felt you know comfortable enough to come back, and it's understandable. But just pray for them, because I know you know, people do want to be back in church. Amen. Let's pray that we can get through all of this. Amen. Maybe everything will change after the election. It seems like everybody thinks that's going to fix everything. <laughs> and I'm sure that ain't going to happen. All right. <clears throat> Mark 11. Mark 11. Look at verse number 19 with me and we'll have a word of prayer. It says in verse number 19, And when even was come, he went out of the city. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursedest is withered away. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, Have faith in God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do love you. We thank you, Lord, for, thank you for our church. Thank you for our church family. Lord, I thank you that those that are here tonight, Lord, what a blessing. And Lord, also those that aren't here with us. But Lord, I pray that we can all get back together here shortly, that you'll be able to put, Lord, all this stuff with the virus and the health issues, Lord, behind us. And Lord, I am looking forward to having our full family back together again. And I do pray that you help all of us, Lord, to really, Lord, take some time and really grow. Lord, and as we've had plenty, probably more time than we've had in a lot of times, Lord, just be able to spend time to, with our family, with those that are important to us, as well as, you know, Lord, your word and, and learning and growing. I pray that you help us tonight to do just that, to grow through your word. Help me to be the pastor of your people that you've given us here to, to learn and grow and, and, Lord, to reach out and, and, Father, just really make a difference in our lives as well as in the lives that we come in contact with. Lord, I pray that you bless the preaching of your word this evening. Help it to be clear and glorifying to you. We love you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now here in this passage, um, I've preached out of this passage. I'm sure you've read it a good number of times. Um, Jesus sees this, this fig tree and does, sees that it's not bearing fruit. And uh, the application to that is a fruit tree is supposed to bear fruit. Amen. And so he sees this tree, he curses the tree, and then the next day um, they go walking by the tree and Peter notices that it's all dried up from the roots. So the tree truly got cursed and, and you know, Peter in this one, it says, he, he calls him out and he says, hey, the fig tree which you're cursed, it's withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto them, have faith in God. You know, when I've read that, that scripture, it always kind of, I guess it kind of confused me, especially in the beginning. It seems like an odd answer to a statement about the tree. 
Anybody felt that way or is it just me? You know, all right, a few of us. So he sees this and he sees this tree and it doesn't bear fruit and then he curses it and it's withered away. And I understand that. And Peter points out this tree and he says, wow, that really worked. You know, it's withered away from the roots. And then Jesus' comment is, have faith in God. Well, what, what exactly does that mean? I mean, as you, as you look at the scriptures, you read the, the true story that happened there, and, and he makes it very clear, you know, have faith in God. It's just like, okay, all right, what are you talking about? And so he says in the next scripture, I don't think I have it up there, but he says, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall no doubt in his heart, but he shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. So he goes down to use the illustration of moving the mountain. And I, when I got that understanding, I started really understanding a little bit where Jesus was coming because he was using this tree as a teaching lesson to his disciples truly about faith. And he was saying, because... I was thinking when I read that story, especially a number of times I've read that story, I was thinking it had something to do with the tree itself. And there is application to that. We've I preached on that. I've heard preaching on it. You know how we are examples of um, trees in the Bible. Men are. And as men, we're supposed to bear fruit for the Lord. And if you're not bearing fruit, you're not really worth being here in that aspect. You know, you're not doing your job. You're not doing what you're there for. And so, you know, that's the spiritual application you can use in this. And that's all, all true. But what, the more I look at it, I believe in this instance, I believe it was more of a shock to Peter or a revelation to Peter that he seen Jesus curse the tree the day before and now he sees it withering away. I don't think the application to Peter at that moment was the whole tree, fruit, not bearing fruit and all that stuff. I think it was more of, wow, Jesus really can do something great here. <laughs> I mean, that more of a shock of like, wow, he cursed the tree and now it's withered away from its roots. You know, it was more of a, um, impressive shocker to Peter. You guys understand that a little bit? And so what happens is, as Peter looks at this, and he's kind of like, kind of sat back a little bit and saying, wow, look at what Jesus did here. Jesus said, have faith in God. Almost like he's telling Peter, why would you be surprised that I can do that? You know, almost, almost like telling Peter, almost like, Duh, I'm Jesus, you know, I'm God, you know, kind of thing. It's more of like, hey, don't you have faith in me? And I want you to think a little bit about that because, you know, I don't know, there's been a good number of times in my life where something has happened and it kind of amazes you, you know, where it was, it was God. Me and Dennis were talking a little bit about some of the things he, he taught on Sunday for his Sunday school and talking about different things with Israel and stuff before church. And, and some of the amazing thing God, things God has done for Israel in our time, literally since 1949 when they became a nation, like the wars and different things and the, you know, how God has made that land of Israel so prosperous with you know, fruits and you know, agriculture that it was a dry wasteland before and it's prophecy in the Bible for telling that and you look at some of this stuff that even the world can't give an explanation for even in our modern day and yet we still kind of go like wow that, that's pretty amazing but why is it that it's really amazing to us you know I understand the um freshness of it it's kind of like it's 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 exciting I get that amen it is it's exciting when you see prophecy happening or when you see something that is definitely out of the ordinary going on in life you know it's like if you're paying attention to your bible and what's in the happenings of the world today it's it's pretty exciting watching this stuff happen right before our eyes and I get that but I, it shouldn't be a shock that God can do these things right you understand that look at your bible at Galatians chapter 3 verse number 26 I'll just give one scripture it says Galatians 3, verse 26, it says, And ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. 
So Jesus tells his disciples, have faith in God. And then here in the book of Galatians, Paul's writing to the church in Galatia, and he says, hey, we're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So it's our faith in Christ Jesus that gives us the, the ability to be the children of God. Amen? And we all know that. I'm sure everybody in here tonight can understand that. And so it's not just having faith. It's having faith in Jesus Christ. It's specific. You know, it's not just having the kind of faith that is, you know, about anything or just belief in general, which a lot of, un unfortunately, a lot of religions teach that nowadays. The more the ecumenical movement is just having faith in God, no matter who you call them, they're thinking that that's the proper faith to have. Well, that's not biblical and it's not true, so you got to have faith in Christ Jesus. But I want to give you a little bit more of an explanation in Scripture. Look over at 2 Kings chapter 4 with me. And you know, this is um, a true story that happened in Scripture that kind of always, um, I want to use the word, amazes a little bit on the faith of an individual here. And so we, we'll pick up the story here in 2 Kings chapter 4, and, and Elisha is the prophet at this time. And so here in 2 Kings chapter 4, look at verse number 12, and it said, actually let me give you a little background before we jump into this. What happens is there's this Shunammite woman. Her and her husband, they're married, and they're a little older. Her husband's actually much older than her in this case, and, and she knows the prophet Elisha, and she knows that he, she, he comes through her um, town um, you know, semi-frequently, and so she asks her husband, he says, why don't we just make up a room for the prophet so when he comes, he has a place to stay? And so they make up this room and stuff for Elisha, and, and, they, and so when he comes through that area, he stays in that room of their house, um, and it's a, you know, she has faith in God, she, you know, wants to do something, you know, you know loving for the, for the man of God, so she makes up this room, and it's his. Well, he stays there for a while, and, and we get to this point here where um, Elisha asks, what can I do for this woman? And so we pick it up here in verse number 12. And he said unto Gehazi, his servant, call the Shunammite. And when he had called her, he stood before, she stood before him, and he said unto him, um, say now unto her, behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? Wouldest thou be spoken for, the, for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. Basically, she's saying, I don't, I don't really need anything. And he said, what then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, verily, she hath no child and her husband is old. And he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the door and he said, about this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace the son. And she said, nay, my Lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. Now, let me stop you here for a moment. This woman does believe this man's a man of God. She has faith in God for sure. But when Elisha says, you're going to have a child, kind of like the Abraham, Sarah type thing, you know, her husband's old. She doesn't believe that she's going to, by this time in her mind, she doesn't believe she's going to have children. And so when she says this, she says, hey, don't lie to me. <laughs> don't lie to me. Don't say that to me. Because that's very personal and very strong emotions go align with this, with this woman, with most women in, the, in these cases. And so she basically says, no, but the Bible tells the next scripture, she has a son. And so, um, and when the child was grown, it fell on a day, in verse 18, that when he went unto, out to his father to the reapers, he said unto his father, my head, my head. And he said to the lad, carry him to his mother. And when he had taken him and brought him to his mother, he sat on her knees until noon, and then what? And then died. Now, I want you to understand something. When Elisha first told her that you're going to have a child, she really didn't believe it. She, her faith wasn't that strong at that point. But then, she had a child. Now, that kind of cemented her faith to this point. And so she has this child, the child's growing, he's going out to help his father in the fields, and something happens, he comes down with something, and maybe it could be an aneurysm, he said it's in his head, I don't know, but he dies, he dies later that day. Now look what happens here. Now this is kind of interesting when you read the story, and it says in verse 21, and she went up and laid, laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. 
And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the asses, that I may run to the man of God and come again. And he said, Wherefore wilt thou go to him today? It is, it is neither new moon nor Sabbath. And she said, It shall be well. Now I want you to understand really what's going on here. She's not even telling her husband that their son is dead here. That's, this is, I'd be a little upset if I were her husband, of course, at this time. But she's not telling her husband. And she says, just, I need to have one of the young men go with me so I can go after the man of God. And he says, hey, it's not that, why would you do that? It's not the time of year or anything for him to come. And she just said, it will be well. It's all well. Everything's good. Just says, it shall be well. Verse 24, then she saddled on that, said unto her servant, drive and go forward, slack not thy riding for me, except I bid thee. So she went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. And it came to pass when the man of God saw her afar off that he said unto Gehazi his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her and say unto her, Is it well with thee? Is it well with thy husband? Is it well with the child? And she answered what? It is well. Now is she lying here? I mean, it sounds like she's lying. I mean, things aren't well, clearly. But I want you to understand the full story. In verse 27, when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away, and the man of God said, Let her alone, for her soul is vexed within her, and the Lord hath hid it from me, and hath not told me. Then she said, Did I desire a son of my Lord? Did, not I, did I not say, Do not deceive me? And he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loins, and take thy staff in thine hand, and go to thy way. And if thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again, and lay my staff upon the face of the child. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth... And as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. So he didn't follow, she didn't follow behind Gehazi. Even though Gehazi was going to take care of the son, she said, I'm staying with you. Because she knows that Elisha is the direct man, the man that is in between her and God, basically, at this point. She trusted um, Elisha. He's the one who had the power within, that God gave him to give her a child. And she said, listen, I'm not leaving you. Gehazi can go ahead, but I'm staying with you. And so it goes on to say, um, in verse 32, And when Elisha was coming to the house, behold, the child was dead and laid upon his bed. And he went in therefore and shut the door upon them twain and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up and lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her and when she was coming unto him, he said, take up thy son. Then she went in and fell at his feet, fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. This story is amazing. I mean, I don't, I don't care who you are. It's amazing, you know. A child dead is given life again. Praise God. But that's not a big deal for God, is it? No, this is not a big deal for God. And this woman had faith that God could heal and give her son life back again. She believed it. To the point where she told her husband, it is well. She told the servant, it is well. And she brought Elisha back to the house and let him do whatever he was going to do in his, in his call out with God. And when she went in, she picked him up and walked away with her son. She had faith in God at this point to believe that God can give her son life again. That's amazing. That's amazing in itself that somebody that is just like you and I can have that kind of faith. And I've talked a little bit about something like this a couple weeks ago, I believe it was, and I used an illustration. There was a movie called, uh, I always forget the name of that movie, but um, a woman that had a son that, that um, fell into the lake, um, a frozen lake, and he actually died. Um, and he was actually deemed dead in the hospital. The, the doctors took like 45 minutes of life support on him and they gave up. And the mom came in and she just started praying and calling out to God and just saying, Lord, please give my son life again. Give him breath again. 
And then all of a sudden, beep, 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 he came back to life. The surgeon and the doctors that, that took care of him, they moved him to another hospital, to one of the specialists in that field of the world that, have, that is one of the renowned um, doctors. They said, he won't make it through the night. Get your family prepared. And she kept having faith. She said to the doctor, you do what you can do. Do your best and leave the rest to God. Within four days, this child came out of the coma that they put him in. The doctor said that even if he did come alive after he, they realized that he's making it a couple days, they said that he won't, he won't have brain, he'll have brain damage. He came out and immediately, no brain damage, walked out of the hospital within like a week or so and perfect kid to this day. And that's in our day. And it's made a movie out of it. And we look at these movies like, wow, it's amazing. But you know what? That's God. And it's not amazing for God. It really isn't. You know, God can do that with ease. And he's done multiple stories kind of like that. And, and I was really going over a lot of things lately, even in my own life, and just, where's our faith? Where is our faith? Where's our faith? What is our faith in? You know, do we have faith like this mom with her child? I can see the desire to have that faith. Amen? The desire to want God to do a miracle in your life. God forbid if something like that ever happened. But do you have the faith going into it and not just trying to have it during it? Think about that for a moment. See, I pray with all my heart that never happens to me in my life and my family and even people I know, my loved ones. I pray I never have to deal with that kind of thing. But you know what? I believe God can do that with ease, right? Do you believe God can do, give somebody life back with ease? He can. And I think most of us know that with our head. We, we believe God can, but the question always is, will God, right? Amen. And, and that's true. And I get that. I, you know, I've gone through similar questions like that in my life. I, I always put it to him, let his will be done. You know, but I want you to look at something else. Look at Colossians chapter 2 with me. Colossians chapter 2, all the way back into your New Testament. <clears throat> and in verse number 4 of Colossians 2, it says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So this is Paul talking to the church in Colossus this time, and he says, don't let people fool you with their beguiling words. They're trying to trick you, you know, with their own words and trying to tell you some kind of story and everything. And we live in a time that we, we hear charlatans, you know, religious charlatans all the time, and how if you do this, you'll get healed, or if you have this problem, you come to the healing meeting, they'll heal you and all this. I always say, just go to the hospital and take care of the problem there, amen? You know, it's just, if all this stuff is true, and I know God is in the healing business, and I know he's there to, God can do anything and does these amazing things even to this day, but we shouldn't be fooled by the beguiling of men by the trickery of men, by the words of people trying to gain something for their own benefits. But we also can't be so fooled that our faith is lacking because of the deceivableness that's going on in this world today, the deceitfulness of so many things and so many people. See, we can almost become very negative with the way we think as Christians nowadays, and I think even more so in certain um, religious organizations like, you know, the conservative Christians, you know, we don't see as much or we don't get involved as much in some of the miracle type stuff or the healing because God is and still in the healing business and stuff. But, and I don't like saying business, but he heals, amen? And he can do amazing things and he does on a regular basis. But we got to get ourselves to the point as God's children that we have faith in God. Not in man. It's just, it almost seems a little bit like the Shunammite woman that she might have had a little more faith in Elisha rather than properly placed in God if you didn't look at the wording of the scriptures right because she just wanted to stick with Elisha. 
She wasn't concerned about Gehazi. But the point is, she had a faith in God before Elisha came around. She had a respect and honor for the Lord to make a room for this man because she recognized him as being a man of God, even called him a man of God. And so she knew that this man was just in relationship with God. And so she knew if an answer was going to come like it did in the original time with giving her child, it came through this man. So you got to be a little careful. See, she was at a different time than today. God doesn't have to work through a prophet anymore. Amen? He does work through men of God and preachers and pastors and evangelists and stuff like that, and, and that's true. But God can work directly with you. You have as much access as Elisha did today. Amen? Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man is what availeth much. So that's any righteous person can have the same amount of power of Elisha today. Right? So the question comes down to this. Do we? Do we have that kind of faith? Do you have that kind of faith to where, all right, my child just died. God, I'm going to plead to you that you do something that isn't normal. My child's really sick. They've come down with cancer. Lord, I'm going to plead to you knowing that you can do a miracle here and I want to be a part of that one. Amen? Amen. But what about the lesser ones? You know, we, we're concerned like the virus and stuff with health, you know, and Lord, please heal this or take care of this. I've been praying that God will just kind of do something special and get rid of this virus. We don't need a vaccines. We don't need, you know, WHO and the UN and all these other Fauci and all this stuff. God can just get rid of it. He can be gone tomorrow if he wants to. Amen? He can just be gone and people can say, we don't know what happened. God, amen, that can happen. Why don't we pray for those things? We've prayed for years as church, you know, when we have our, you know, our um, picnics and stuff. We ask, Lord, Lord, give us a good day. We, me and my wife have seen living examples of miracles where it was supposed to rain out that day, but then it changed at the last minute. Just God gave us, just for something simple, just to have a day of fun, you know, as Christians. I've seen that kind of thing happen, I don't know how many times over the years. But you know, where's our faith? Where's our faith? Where's the steadfastness of our faith? And I'm not trying to, I don't know, make something up here or anything. I want it to be more of, we need to, as God's children, start living by faith. And what does that mean? What does that mean in our life? I think we get so, I keep trying to think of the word, you know, that almost like, What's the word I'm looking for? Almost like not really putting the belief into it anymore about the miracles of God because we get so used to the everyday living as a Christian, as a child of God. We see what God does for us to where we almost get apathetic to the point of our life is the way it is and how God's been working is the way he always really does work. And so we don't expect the miracles, the amazing things, the things that kind of are out of the ordinary as much. And so when those things face us, sometimes out of desperation we call out to God, wanting him to do something, but not fully having faith that he will. Let me go a little step further. You guys know this passage. Look at Job 1, and we know the story about Job, so I'm not going to go into the whole thing. But... In Job chapter 1, as you know, in ver starting in verse number 13, the Bible tell tells us here that there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And so, you know, this is a pretty big shocker, you know, killed all their servants that were out there plowing and, and with the asses with them and, and took them away. And then in verse number 16, while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I am only escaped alone to tell thee. Verse 17, and he was speaking and another one came in. The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels, have carried them away and have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I am alone escaped alone to tell thee. 
Verse 18, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Worst day ever anybody has ever had. Loses everything, literally, in a day, in, within minutes. As one's talking and finishes, another one comes in, gives them more bad news, more bad news, four times, to the point where everything is gone but him and his wife. At this point, most people, I would even say most Christians, especially as a pastor counseling people over the years, even most Christians would just fall apart at this point. Lose their mind. Need drugs to get through it. If they do. And I tell you what, I've envisioned something like this happening in my mind while reading this and just can't bear to think losing my kids, all of them at one time. That would, I, it, I can't imagine that. The emotion in that's got to be tremendous. And I don't care who you are, these are real people. This is a real person that this happened to. That blew his mind, right? He stopped speaking shortly after this. He just sat down in sackcloth and ashes and just sat there not saying a word, even while his other friends were trying to come up with answers why this happened and condemning him. It was pretty rough. But we know what he said immediately after all that. Verse number 20, then Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and what? He worshipped. And he said, worshipping, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. You know what, that's real faith. He didn't lose his faith in God at all. It didn't even waver his faith in God. Right in the literal nightmare that he was going through, he worshiped God. He praised God. During the hardest time of his entire life, that it would seem like God stopped taking care of him for a little while, if you go through that kind of thinking. He didn't even charge God foolishly. He, he didn't blame God for it. He actually said, you know, the Lord's given me. The Lord now has taken it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is a real man, real trouble, with real faith. I have been a pastor now for a good number of years, and I'm telling you, I've seen people lose their faith with far, far less than this. I've seen people blame God for things that aren't even near this extreme. So the question is, what about us? Where's our faith? Where are we at? Would this rattle your faith? Would this give you an excuse to say, <laughs> there ain't a God? Or if there is, he ain't what I thought. Or why God? Why would you do this? Blame it on him. See, the thing is, we really need to understand God. And we really need to increase our faith and have faith that is steadfast. But in order to do that, you really got to know God. Amen? So the question comes down to this is, who is your faith in? Is your faith in religion? If it is, religion's going to do you wrong. Religion has done me wrong, and I'm a pastor. If it's in people, people are going to, they're going to do you wrong. They're not going to live up to your full expectations. It's true. There's people that don't come to church anymore because of something that happened in church, a church they were going to, something that a preacher or another Christian said to them, or, you know, they use these excuses and they start 
applying that to God. And so if your faith is in anything other than the Lord alone, when those trials come, you're not going to have that faith. Amen? It's just not, you're not going to have the faith. So if your faith is in anything else, whether it's in substance or circumstance, you're going to fail in your faith. You're not going to have the right faith that you need to get through life properly. So the question is, where is your faith? It should always, our faith should always side with God and being faithful to him. If you can literally go through something like the Shunammite woman or what Job went through or what many other people in the Bible, Esther went through and Ruth went through and what other people go through and still hold firm to your faith in God, you're in the right place. Amen? But the only way to truly know that is two ways. Either think back to a place where you got struggled, where you had hard times come your way did that increase your faith or decrease your faith? And the only other way to really know that is when you go through something in the future, how you're going to react at that point. But the key to that is be prepared today for what's going to happen tomorrow. Amen? God forbid that happens to any of us. When I preach messages like this, I always get a little concerned because most of my messages come because God's using me for something to preach a message about something. And I pray none of this happens to my family or anything. True, true. You know, that's where I'm at. But at the same point, I want to believe with all my heart that anything that bad comes my way, it's not God I blame. It's not going to pull me away from the Lord. It's just going to solidify my faith in him and, if anything, grow it stronger. See, Christians, we really need to have faith. We are living in a time that things are not well for Christians. Let's just look around you. It's not well for Christians. But we don't need the circumstance of this world to test our faith. Just life sometimes is going to test our faith. Amen? Where are you in your faith? That's the question tonight. Where's your faith? Who is your faith in? Do you think that your faith is strong enough today? Why don't you ask yourself that question? Do I believe that I have strong faith? And if you don't think you do, let's get there. I'll give you this short little thing, and I know it's going to sound very simple. But how do you increase, our, increase your faith? The only way to really do that is you've got to get close with the Lord. Because the more you know him, the more you trust him. And the more you trust him, the more your faith will increase. Just where it comes down. And you know, we all need that. Because the Holy Spirit's there to just really give us what we need to get through whatever we're going to experience in life. Whether it's big things or whether it's just a bunch of small things or whether it's just everyday life. Satan destroys Christians just with apathy nowadays. But our faith should always be strong and if anything get stronger. Amen? So this message tonight is very simple. Taking these lessons, these real people that went through real situations and how they reacted in their life. And I can give you stories upon stories of real people in the Bible and even people we know today, what their faith was like during times of trial. Look at, the, look at Stephen. What an amazing man. He's getting stoned to death and he's praying for those that are stoning him and trusting the Lord and just saying, Lord, I don't lay this to their cause. Amen? All the way throughout the Bible. The good thing of that is they're ordinary people just like you and I. So we need to live by faith. Amen? If it's not of faith, it's sin. And we're supposed to live by faith. Walk by faith. Amen? Our life is supposed to all be about faith. But let's make sure it's strong faith. Amen? Because I really have this sinking feeling that it's going to be tested more and more in the future. In our future. So let's make sure we can stand up for what's right. Because God's with us. And if God's with us, who can be against us? Amen?
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you again, Lord, for your wonderful word. Thank you for the many men and women in your word that, Lord, had strong faith and followed you.